Tonight on Panorama, life in Afghanistan under Taliban control. It's now eight weeks since the US and its allies left. Thousands fled, but a Panorama team stayed behind. We meet women who are becoming increasingly concerned. This is not the time to be sad. This is the time to be angry. Even if one strand of our hair is visible, the Taliban will whip us and send us home. And the religious minorities living in fear. Because of their terror and not keeping their word, thousands have fled to the mountains. 20 years after 9-11, has Afghanistan once again become a safe haven for international terror groups? This is not just a safe haven, this is, this is a partnership. It's the morning after the final Western evacuation of Afghanistan. The triumphant Taliban are preparing to address the world. The US troops left last night at 1 o'clock. And today, at 8 o'clock, Zebulon Mujahid called us to come for a press conference. He has inside the airport. Reporter Najibullah Qureshi and his team have been filming in Afghanistan throughout the 20-year conflict. The airport is now quiet, but everywhere there are reminders of the desperate attempts to escape. These belongings are all left from the civilians who left in the last 10 days. More than 123,000 people, many of them Afghans, were evacuated. Those people even wouldn't get a chance to take their belonging with them. Literally, these bags are, could be their memories, but oh, it's, it's left behind. The Taliban invite the team to see what the US forces left behind. <laughs> Military equipment worth millions of dollars has been wrecked to prevent it being used by the Taliban. At today's press conference, Zabiullah Mujahid, the new government spokesman, ushers in a new era. باز هم می خواهد که با تمام دنیا روابط حسنه داشته باشه نره تکبیر نره تکبیر دفنستان اسلامی مره On the streets of Kabul, for some there appears to be a sense of relief کشتار ختم شد آرامی آمد خسای شما بسان شد خوری بود فساد بود it's more than 20 years since the Taliban were last in power. Back then, they enforced an extreme version of Islamic law. Beatings and public executions were common. Girls couldn't go to school. Women couldn't work. The Taliban's official spokesman insists they'll do things differently this time. We want traditional Islamic rules for our society, but instead of forcing people by whips, force and pressure, we will do so through the mosques and teachings. We want to do it through preaching and advice, not force. But when it comes to rights for women, the answer was less clear. 
The Islamic Emirate is committed to giving women everything that has been prescribed and explained under Sharia law. Based on these, we will treat women with dignity. Many women feel their lives are already being restricted. Some take to the streets. Our team tried to film one of the protests, but are shut down almost immediately. <laughs> This is Nargis and her friend. Nargis is a third year sociology student at Kabul University and was only one when the Taliban were last in power. Life in Kabul was good and it was going well. We had freedom and we could do anything we wanted. We would go to work, we would study, we had identity, but now it's different. Suddenly, we're interrupted. Women, it seems, are no longer allowed to eat in restaurants. The women slip away quietly. The men appear to be working undercover for the Taliban to inform on those who break the rules. Nargis is determined to speak and wants to meet again, but this time in a less public place. The Taliban say there's no problem. We are not the Taliban of the past. We'll allow women to work and study. But it's all a lie. Nargis is also an actor and model. Well, at the moment, everything stopped. We can't work. We aren't even allowed to attend university. Every day, the situation's getting worse. For example, until a few days ago, only Taliban soldiers had arrived. Just in the last two days, their intelligence and the vice and virtue branches have also arrived, which is really scary for us. Wherever we go, even if one strand of our hair is visible, they say it's against Islam. Why does she do that? She's trying to promote Western culture. I know if we go to work, the Taliban will whip us and send us home. It's hard. The vice and virtue police enforce the Taliban rules. And Taliban supporters feel emboldened to speak out. Later, the Taliban distanced themselves from his remarks. These seven to ten-year-olds have been allowed back to school. But since the Taliban's return to power, secondary school-age girls have not been invited back. It's not yet clear if this is a permanent ban.
Next door, the teacher is taking a class for boys only. No, I only teach boys. I don't know what to say, because their future has been ruined. I wish they could continue their education. My sisters study at the university, but they have difficulty going there. Everyone's afraid. When I come here to teach, I feel frightened too. The Taliban think women should only be at home, whether they are educated or not, they should stay at home. The team is invited to film a protest against what's happening in schools. The Taliban don't allow unofficial protests. Almost immediately, security arrive. They're armed with guns and whips. Bystanders are driven back so the protesters can be isolated. Warning shots are fired over their heads. And the women are quickly dispersed. The team visits one of Afghanistan's most prominent women's rights activists. My fear is mainly right now for the Afghan woman, yes, but for Afghanistan. My fear is for Afghanistan. Mahbuba Siraj was offered a flight out of the country, but has chosen to stay. The face of this, this town has changed. There used to be women walking around the streets of Kabul. There used to be a feeling that, you know, we are all the citizens of the same, of the same country and we are in this, this city, men and women. But now it's no longer that. She's waiting to see if the Taliban will keep their promise to be more moderate this time round. If they really have changed, they have to prove it. I am here in Afghanistan, I want to tell them, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm sitting right here. Because the women, the 18 million women of Afghanistan are not dead. And the 18 million women of Afghanistan, they really need a voice. The interview is interrupted by a woman asking for help. We agree to hide her identity because her granddaughter has gone missing. <laughs> The woman says her granddaughter had been hoping to leave the country before the Taliban took control. You can't do anything? No, nothing. What am I supposed to do? It's getting late, so Mabuba tells the woman to go home. I cannot protect her, Najib John. I cannot protect any woman. These women, they have to protect themselves. How can I protect them? Tell me, how can I protect? What can I do? It make you feel sad? It makes me feel angry and sad. This is not the time to be sad. This is the time to be angry. If I can do something, I want to do something. Mabuba has no idea what's happened to the girl. But there have been other reports of women being abducted and forced into marriage by the Taliban.
It's not just women who are feeling under threat. Asadullah is a law student and civil rights activist from Kabul. He funds his studies with a part-time job selling fabrics. He says he was stopped on the street two days earlier. A Taliban ranger pickup truck stopped and they got off. They asked me where I was going. I told them I was a student and was on my way home. They started frisking me. They found my university card and an identity card of the civil rights organization I was working for. After they found the card, their commander, who was still in the vehicle, then got off and started beating me with a whip. The whip was rubber and it left stripe marks. After beating me severely, they put me in the vehicle and took me to the police station, where I was held for about two hours. There were many people there, regardless of whether they had committed an offence or not, and without any proof of a crime. Asadullah was released without charge. The Taliban said they had nothing to do with people's private lives. However, from what we see, they're not keeping their promises. The team head west out of Kabul to the home of the Hazaras, who are Shia Muslims. The Taliban are Sunni and have persecuted the Hazara for decades. When they were last in power, they destroyed the world-famous symbols of Hazara heritage, the Bamiyan Buddhas. Now the Taliban are back, Hazara journalist and human rights activist Ishak Akrami has fled his home and gone into hiding. The situation isn't good. On the first day when they came, many government offices and homes were looted. People's cars were seized. He described an incident at the end of August where 13 Hazara were killed. Most of them had been part of the former government's security force. After the Taliban declared national amnesty and indicated they would not harm politicians, security forces, journalists, etc., they told these people to come and surrender their weapons and that they would not be harmed. They came back from the mountains and surrendered their weapons to the Taliban. The Taliban then started shooting them. Amnesty International shared this footage of the bodies with Panorama and confirmed the Taliban were responsible, something the Taliban deny. Because of their terror and not keeping their word, thousands have fled to the mountains and other districts. Many reporters and civil activists are not in Bamiyan right now and are on the run. I have come here, trying to find a way to get out of Afghanistan. The people who have left are educated, who work in government, who were civil activists or reporters. They were the elite of Afghanistan. We have to accept that. This is a bitter reality. Since we filmed with him, Ishaq has been able to escape Afghanistan. At first, there were hopes the new Taliban regime might be more moderate. This is Abdul Hani Barada who led the Taliban delegation during peace talks with the West in Qatar. He spoke to Najibullah in January last year. We hope that steps will be taken to stop bloodshed in Afghanistan and that Afghans will be allowed to live in peace. This is what we ask from the international community. He promised a new Afghan government for all and hoped that he would lead it. It will be inclusive of all ethnicities and people will be given jobs based on competence. Because we are all Afghans living in Afghanistan and even those who've left Afghanistan are our brothers. But two weeks after the U.S. withdrawal, there were rumors of a power struggle inside the presidential palace. 
Sources within the Taliban say there was a violent standoff between Baraja's moderates and the hardliners. Najibullah spoke to the United Nations Afghan security expert in New York. I think this is starting to show that there are some fault lines within the Taliban. It was relatively easy for the group to hold its discipline and its cohesion when it was an insurgency. It's more difficult to do that when you're trying to make difficult decisions uh, with, re with regard to administration of a country. The moderate Barada, it appears, has been sidelined. The most violent of the Taliban factions, the Haqqani network, have been given key jobs. The Haqqani network has its own uh, history uh, of involvement. Uh, in uh, extremist activity and in uh, what they would consider international jihadi uh, activity. They're led by this man, Sirajuddin Haqqani. He's still on America's most wanted list, a $10 million price on his head for organizing some of the deadliest attacks on coalition forces. He's now the country's interior minister with control over police and security. The UN believes his network is still linked to the masterminds of 9-11, the worst terror attack in history. The part of the Taliban that works most closely with Al-Qaeda is the Haqqani network. What's been difficult for Al-Qaeda has been to have a stable, uninterrupted place where they could regroup, recruit, uh, train, uh, raise money, um, all of those sort of support functions that are ultimately necessary to rebuild an offensive capability. And it may be that this change in Afghanistan presents them with a, a, a new and better opportunity than they have elsewhere. And this is not just, say, this is not just a safe haven, this is, this is a partnership. US went to war in Afghanistan to drive Al-Qaeda and their hosts, the Taliban, out. The Taliban are back, and it looks like Al-Qaeda are too. This footage shows Osama bin Laden's former security chief, Amin al-Haq, returning to his homeland from Pakistan. It's been verified by the UN. Despite repeated requests to the Haqqani network for an interview, they did not agree to one. The Taliban continued to insist they have no links with Al-Qaeda and will not shelter them. But there's another terror threat that's already very real. Islamic State in Afghanistan, or ISK. It killed at least 182 people, including 13 US soldiers, outside Kabul airport during the evacuation. And despite Taliban claims to be fighting back, a week ago, more than 50 died in a suicide bombing at a Shia mosque in Kunduz. During the last 20 years of war, millions of Afghans have been driven from their homes. Just this year, an estimated 665,000 have been displaced. Sharanau Park in Kabul is now home for many families with nowhere else to go. This family has been here for two months. Afghanistan 
The World Food Programme says 14 million are at risk of starvation. People queue for hours to get money from the bank, and withdrawals are tightly limited. Obeid runs a small bicycle repair shop. A hundred and fifty Afghanis is a little more than a pound, but still his customer bargains. Obeid needs the work, so takes the offer. Obeid has four grown-up children. They're all unemployed. The new Taliban government of Afghanistan isn't recognized by the international community. Billions of dollars in assets have been frozen. This has forced the Taliban to the negotiating table again. So with the economy in crisis, will they be prepared to change? Women's rights activist Mahbuba Siraj believes they might, and the West should give them a chance. This time, she wants to speak on the phone. We are almost like a runaway runaway train going towards a, a, a human disaster um, because of the economy. But uh, apart from that, you know, I think they're going to be they're going to be willing to do some things. I think I'm seeing some some changes and things might go for the better. I'll be leaving Afghanistan very soon. Why don't you just leave the country? I'm, co I'm committed to staying in Afghanistan. Absolutely. I'm going to have a say and I'm going to have a do as far as as far as making it, uh, making it a beautiful place for the people of Afghanistan. Najibullah Qureshi and his team have now left Afghanistan. It's estimated that by the end of the year, half a million Afghans will have left too.